We'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 19 through 28. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 19 through 28. We're finishing up our series on the book of 1 Thessalonians. The title of today's message is Learn to Discern. Thank you for those who are able to be here in person and those who are joining us online. I heard a story that a man wanted to impress his friends with his eye for art. And as they went to an art gallery together, he forgot his glasses, uh, was nearsighted, and couldn't hardly see his hand in front of his face. But he figured he could wing it with uh, any ab abstract comments and observations he wanted to make. So he approached a frame, began, began criticizing. Why would anybody want to paint something so hideously ugly? I mean, it's a true rendering of the object, but why waste, why waste time painting such a disgusting subject? Everyone was laughing by this time as his wife whispered into his ear, John, that's a mirror. <laughs> And so we need the gift of discernment in our lives, right? Uh, we have complicated issues and we live with complicated times. Uh, we need to be have, have, we need ability to discern uh, what's right and what's wrong. Friends, I don't know if you looked around at all, but we live in an upside down world uh, where things that should be considered right are considered wrong and things that are wrong people consider right. Uh, it really is upside down and the thing is is sometimes it's hard to know what the right thing to do is uh, some things are are really clear and the issues have have not changed but the more complicated this world gets sometimes it's hard even to know what the right thing to do is so in this passage today the main point is for us to learn to discern in a confused world so look with me in first thessalonians chapter 5 uh, verses 19 through 28. He says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Um, so let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Well, thank you for the gift of First Thessalonians. Well, thank you that it has challenged us in many ways. And mainly it has challenged us to make sure that we continue looking up, that we are ready and awaiting um, our Savior. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me today in ways that I cannot do. I pray that we would listen with humble hearts. And Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So point number one, we see the Spirit gives discernment. That's at least one of the things the Spirit does. See, you can't stop God, but you can stifle him from working in your life. It's sort of an absurd statement for us to think that we can stop and thwart the plans of God, because ultimately history will end exactly when God said history will end, uh, that uh, Christ will return exactly when God plans for Christ to return. And so in that sense, absolutely nothing can be changed. You cannot stop God's plan, but you can stifle his work in your life. Biblically speaking, the purpose of the Spirit is uh, varied. It is multifaceted. Now, I'll look at a couple of them here today, uh, but there's a lot of roles that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, serves and does in our lives. Uh, one of them we see is the Spirit helps us with our relationship with God and, and, and the aspect of intimacy. We think about Galatians. The Bible says that we are moved from slaves of sin and that we are moved to sons of God. We are given the title of sons of God. And the Holy Spirit allows us to cry out, Abba, Father. So we get to walk in, uh, in, in a close um, a familial relationship with God because of the work of the Spirit. Uh, it is the Son who saved us, who paid the price uh, for our, our sin. 
but it's the Spirit who brings intimacy with God. The Bible says that it's the Spirit who gives us uh, power. The Holy Ghost would come upon you, is what Jesus said. That Christ living in you is a Spirit living in you. And so all of these things that seem impossible and difficult to do in Scripture, as I've often said before, are possible and are doable because of the work of the Spirit, because of the Spirit of God living in you. The Bible says the Spirit also brings illumination. He helps us understand a spiritual reality. It is God who helps us. It is the Holy Spirit in particular who helps us understand God's word. We're able to discern it spiritually because of the gift of the Spirit. In the Bible, we see that the Spirit is represented by fire. And we'll talk about that here in in a second. But uh, this is something that if I've ever done premarital counseling with you, and some of them I've had, uh, I want you to understand this is always true of the Holy Spirit's leading. If you are praying and you're trying to make decisions in your life, you're trying to figure out what is right and what is wrong, understand that the Spirit's leading will always glorify Christ. It will always promote Christ holiness and it will always be consistent with scripture the spirit's leading will always glorify christ it will promote holiness and it's consistent with scripture so you're saying man I, I feel that i'm being led in this direction does it violate any of these three principles that we just shared because if it does i tell you it's, it's not from the spirit of god and i've talked with many people in counseling said man i really feel that i should be doing this I said, well, does that line up with God's word? And they say, no. Well, so then it's not from God. That's from you or for something more evil than you. So as I've mentioned before, the spirit is represented by fire in a variety of places in scripture. When we think about uh, Pentecost and, uh, and tongues of fire, and that was the spirit coming down upon the church, we, uh, we see him often represented by fire. Not exclusively so, but often. And it says, do not quench The spirit, quench means to extinguish, to stifle, that we can restrict or release the spirit's work in our life. Are you listening to me, church? You and I, God has allowed us to release or to restrict God's working in our life. And the spirit will not Uh, force himself upon people although he certainly could we are have the ability to restrict or to release and we can do it in a couple of ways we can do it first of all by disobedience that God says stop doing this you know that you have an an attitude a, a belief a habit that is wrong. I know I should not treat people this way I know God's word says I should not do this thing but I'm going to do it anyway. God, I, I know your word pro, 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 prohibits it. I know the spirit is clear, is pulling and tugging at my heart not to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. The Bible says when you do that, you begin to stifle and quench the spirit's work in your life. You can also stifle it by disregarding the spirit. So not just uh, uh, doing things that we know that we shouldn't, but we are ignoring things that God tells us to do. When God says, hey, I want you to reach out to that neighbor that nobody in your neighborhood likes, okay? I I want you to reach out to that person. I I want you to be kind and gracious to that person at at work. I want you to share the gospel with somebody. I want you to invite somebody over to your home and you're saying, oh, Lord, I'm not going to do that. I want you to serve in this ministry. No, no, no. I can't do it. I'm afraid. I don't want to. I'm too busy. When you do that, the Bible says that you can stifle the Spirit's work in your life. Like many of you, I have a a gas grill at the house, and and when you live in Arizona, it gets a little windy sometimes, right? And so I'll turn that uh, gas grill on, and I'll go out there, and I'll think that chicken's cooking, and you come back, you know, 10 minutes later, and you realize the flame's gone, and it's cooking nothing, right? Uh, It's it's the way it works. And uh, that can happen for a a variety of reasons. Maybe uh, it was blown out. Maybe it's from corrosion. Maybe you ran out of fuel. All those things happen and have happened in my life. Either way, it's not working. 
And when the Spirit's work in, in, in our lives sometimes become a uh, distraction of or disobedience, we can blow out the Spirit's flame in our lives. Maybe from corrosion and sin in our life. Or maybe we've been so busy uh, taking it, we've been, we've been giving and, and not filling ourselves with God's word and God's presence in our life. We're just running on empty. When you do that, the spirit is stifled in your life. The Bible says the spirit gives us spiritual discernment. Read along with me in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 13 through 14. It says, and we impart, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. We say it is the Spirit of God who helps us understand the spiritual truth that is in Scripture. It's not that the lost person cannot comprehend uh, the, the words and the syntax of Scripture, but they cannot understand the spirit of it because they have not humbled themselves before God, given their lives over and become his child where the Spirit helps them to discern. Now I'm going to tell you something that's painfully true and painfully obvious. Is sin complicates things, right? I mean, we are facing in our times problems that our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents have never had to deal with. And we have to work through these issues as believers. We want to make sure that we are biblically sound, that we're walking in truth, but we're also walking in grace and mercy as our Savior did. But sin complicates all the things all the time. I have people come and talk to me and say, Pastor, I, I, I don't know what to do. This, this family situation, this, uh, this problem at work, I, I, it's so complicated. I, I, I'm not sure what to do. And I say, good, I, I don't know what to do either. Because the truth of the matter is, is sin complicates things sometimes. It's not the way God designed it. It's, it's twisted. It's morphed into something that it's not supposed to be. It's without prayer and scripture and discernment, we will not know the answer to some of these questions. Sin complicates things. See, discernment is required for all, but it's gifted to some. It's the Spirit's defense against false teachings and false belief. 1 Corinthians 12, 10 says uh, that the Spirit gives the ability to distinguish between spirits. It's often referred to as the gift of discernment, the ability, the supernatural ability of some to be able to distinguish right from wrong, evil from good, truth from what is false. As believers, we must fan the flame of the Spirit's work in our life. I'm telling you, friends, this church will accomplish nothing, nothing apart from the Spirit's work. I'm telling you, we can get the best cameras. Uh, you can get a better preacher. Uh, we can get the nicest facilities. We can plan things out all the time. I'm not saying those things are bad things, but apart from the Spirit of God working in this church, we will accomplish nothing. And we need the Spirit working in our lives individually as well as collectively. I tell you, when you see the, har the, the harm and the hurt and the difficulties around Tucson, I, I know that you have a heart that wants to see people change. I know that you want to make an influence and in, uh, impact in this world. The way that you do that is by allowing the Spirit of God to work in you. Are you listening to me, church? The Bible says, do not quench the Spirit because it is the Spirit who allows us to make a change in this world. The Spirit does many things, but one of the things the Spirit does, He gives us discernment. Look at point number two with me. The Scriptures give discernment. Verse 19 says, do not quench the Spirit. But verse 20 says, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. False teaching 
has been part of the church from its inception. Jesus warned, hey, before this, 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 this show even gets on the road, I want you to understand there are going to be false teachers, false uh, beliefs that are going to come in and, and infect the church that are, are, are combat for the, and, and, and compete for the, the hearts of believers. And you better be ready and aware the Bible says they can come from evil spirits. They can come from false teachers, and you better be aware of them. They communicate falsely in word and in deed. The Bible says they can perform miracle signs and wonders and have done that falsely. So there's people who can teach incorrectly, but there's also people who can act incorrectly. Uh, the Bible doesn't say that the supernatural activity is only for uh, believers, right? All throughout Scripture, we see that, uh, the, that Satan's side also has supernatural ability, and he uses those. We have to be careful about what we see as true. We live in a confused and a deceitful world. We have people who are uh, increasingly uh, basing their truth off of their uh, experience, or what they enjoy. I mean, if you talk to your, most of your coworkers, or how, how do you determine what is right and what is wrong? Well, be from my sort of own personal experience, or, or, or what brings me joy. And so, uh, so I'm not going to do what God says, uh, not because it's it's all that complicated. I don't understand it because I want to do what I, I, I want to do, and so that's what I determine truth by. And the Bible says when that happens, it begins uh, it brings uh, confusion and harm into this world. Because people's versions of truth changes from person to person. What you think is right and another person thinks right changes all the time. And it brings harm. Uh, I, I heard a, a pastor give this definition for discernment I thought was pretty good. It says, discernment is the skill of understanding and applying God's word with the purpose of separating truth from error and right from wrong. I also heard another pastor in a similar way say spiritual discernment is the ability to distinguish divine truth from error and half truth. So God has given us tools for discernment. He said, he said, he said I know my children are going to face complicated situations, and so I've given them the tools uh, that they need. He said, I've given them, uh, given them God's word, an understanding of God's word, and an application of God's word. Here's one of the first principles I want us to pay attention to. See, God's word gives clarity. God's word helps us to see as God sees. It helps us to see things as they really are. Uh, now, many of you guys know that I like college football. Uh, I, I, I don't always like the way that college football goes, uh, uh, as it particularly uh, yesterday in particular, uh, but, uh, uh, but I do like to watch college football, right? And, uh, and, and, I, and I love uh, watching, man, because uh, what you're trying to do is ultimately you're trying to deceive the other team many times. That's, you're trying to uh, make it look like this person's running and this person's throwing, or it's going this direction, it's going this direction. You're trying to deceive the other team. You're trying to find their weaknesses, and so I, I, I love it when, uh, man, when, when a quarterback, when he, he, it looks like he hands it off to maybe the, the running back, and, and, uh, and he goes that, and the, the running back goes this way, sort of acting like he has the ball, and all the defense goes over there, and the coaches from the other team think that he's going this way, but then the quarterback has the ball, man, and he starts running around the other side, but it is very hard. It, it happens on occasion uh, where the cameraman gets confused, but nine times out of ten, man, that everybody Everybody's going the wrong direction. The fans are looking the wrong direction. The coaches are looking the wrong direction. But that cameraman, from a different perspective, does not get confused. Now, that's not perfect. That's not infallible because they are people. But God's word brings clarity in a world that is confused about so many things. God's word brings clarity. It brings truth. It brings his perspective on things in a very confused world. In verse 20, it says, do not despise prophecies. Uh, the word here can mean spoken or written words. In the verb form, it means to speak or publicly proclaim. 
Um, scripture is sometimes referred to as prophecy. Uh, in Revelation uh, 1.3 is a passage you are familiar with. It says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, talking about the book of Revelation, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So scripture is referred to as prophecy. So this is important to understand because this is uh, somewhat debated, or it is debated in churches and different denominations. And so from my perspective and my um, study as a, a pastor, it's my understanding that the gift of prophecy uh, where people can speak infallibly for God is not uh, available to the church anymore that God had certain gifts available to the church before the New Testament was complete. Uh, people could perform miracles. They could, uh, they could heal people and, and, and do things that we cannot do now. And that was for a very specific time and a specific place in history. But then God completed his work, and those type of gifts are not available to the church anymore. Now, there's a lot of good and godly people who disagree with me about that, and they can do that. And when we get to heaven, we'll figure it all out one day. But the reality is, and at least my understanding of it, is as prophecy now, at least for the church, the gift of prophecy is the spirit-empowered skill of publicly proclaiming God's word. So God has spoken. We have the Old and the New Testament now, and God is not going to give us further revelation. So we are dependent upon the word of God for the truth of God. So he says, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. That there is nothing under the jur- that's not under the jurisdiction of God, his word, and his authority. So you must put uh, your politics, uh, your uh, personal beliefs, uh, your theological systems, you must test everything with God's word and make sure they line up with that. I don't care how you were raised. I don't care what you believe. If it does not line up with the word of God, it is not right. And so you must change. You don't get to change God's word. To test everything implies that we are to separate things in in order to understand their differences. We understand there are counterfeit gospels and truth. Uh, There's a, a prosperity gospel, which is no gospel at all. There is a social gospel which is no gospel at all. There's a gospel of works that says you can earn your way to God sort of plus Jesus, which is no gospel at all. We see people have the, the, the idolizing of self in our culture. Now, that's not a gospel, but it's, it's a wrong truth. It's, it's about your self-actualization. It's about your self-awareness. It's about your self-identity more than anything else. And if you've got that right, then you've got everything right. It is the idolizing of the self. And God says, first and foremost, it's not about you. You matter. You're important to God. That matters. But God is first and foremost who matters. And we line ourselves up with him and his significance. So finally, the last principle I want to look at, we see, prince, we see that um, discernment is a skill. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 through 14 says this. For everyone who lives on milk, and it's talking about sort of the truth of God's word in this passage, who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish from good and evil. That God said that you can hone your skill of discernment. So don't just stay with the basic truths of the faith. You do need that. Yeah, that's, it's, it's essential, uh, but you can't stop there. You, you must get into the meat of God's word. And that allows you to discern and you can sharpen your abilities to discern in a confused world. You can grow. You can mature. It helps us to see what is true. 
I had my friend bring one of these things by, and, and uh, you guys know what this is. Y'all have seen levels before. And, and so if you can get the level straight, you'll recognize there's a little bubble in between for anybody who may not know what this is. And if you can get the bubble in between the lines here, you can keep it straight and, and, and help you make a straight line or a straight cut. And I'm surprised how many times I'm, I'm trying to put this on a wall, and I've got a frame there, and, and you know, I'm holding it this way. And, and you know, from, a, from close up, it seems uh, like it's straight. You know, I'll have a wife or a friend or somebody behind me, and I'm saying, you know, it looks pretty straight to me. And they're going, no, trust me, it's, 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 it's not straight. And, and so you need to have a, a tool that can tell you what is straight. It can help you what is to discern what it, where you're off and what is, uh, what is off kilter. And the Bible says it is the Spirit of God, whether we're way off on a truth or we're just a little bit off on a truth, that helps us discern what is right. What is wrong? What is off plumb? What is not straight? There's a lot of things that are not straight in this world. And God's word gives clarity to that. Lastly, look at verse 21 and 22 with me. But test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. You see, discernment changes our direction. It brings application to our life. If you are understanding God's word, but that doesn't bring change in your life, then you really aren't understanding God's word at all. Are you listening to me, church? A, 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 a word of God and, and a lesson and a, and a sermon and a devotional time that says, man, that was great, but it doesn't make it to your feet means you didn't really understand it at all. God desires to change and transform us into the likeness of his son through his word. So he says, hold fast to what is good. We know that God is the origin for all things that are good. Anything good in your life is from God. Without exception, the only good that you have in your life is from God because God is good. God, goodness originates from God. It is from his very character. So the Bible says that we are to hold fast to those things which are good. You could almost say hold, those, hold fast those things that are godly because good things ultimately come from God. And it says to abstain from evil. The Bible pictures evil as a distortion, a, a twisting of good things. It uses strong language. It says abstain from these things. To not allow them to take uh, hold of your heart. See, using biblical truth and principles to help you make Decisions to help you live is what God is talking about in this passage. Can I say a word specifically to parents, maybe parents with kids still at the home? Be careful, parents. Do not simply teach your kids rules. Teach them to discern good from evil because temptations are limitless. You cannot make enough rules for how many things can be wrong out there. It's just not possible. So teach your kids to discern what is evil and what is good and how to love and pursue the things that are good. Can I encourage you, brothers and sisters, make sure you are discerning what is good, what is evil, what is wise, what is wasteful, and what is good from what is best. And there is a difference between them. Verse 23, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. That you are never abandoned. He is faithful. No matter, God is, no matter what God is calling you to do, however he is calling you to act, he's faithful. He's not going to leave you. He is going to finish his work in you. And that's an encouraging thought to me. But I encourage you, brothers and sisters, learn to discern in a confused world. <laughs>